Hi, everybody. I think it's uh, about time to get started. So thank you all for coming to our session on Living Service Worlds. My name is Shelley Evanson, and this is Thomas Schneider. Thomas Schneider, in case you didn't hear that. Um, we both come from a company called Fjord, and Fjord is a digital service design organization. Uh, and we actually, uh, we both come from the San Francisco office. I have a global role, uh, but we have um, offices from Istanbul to San Francisco, including Berlin, Paris, Madrid, uh, London, what am I forgetting? Stockholm, Helsinki. Stockholm, and Helsinki. I was just there last week. Um, so we're going to today, um, our talk really is in three parts. The first part is really about a service background and service design worlds, um, how service design works. Um, it's really hard when you come to uh, a place like AIGA and you do a talk and it's really hard to know how much people are actually going to know about service design. So if you know a lot about service design, you'll have to forgive us. We're going to like sort of move through that quickly. But if you don't know very much about it, at least it'll give you a little background. Um, the second part um, are two market trends that we think are dramatically affecting service design today uh, based on our experience and then uh, conclude with three questions that we hope you'll take away with you and think about in terms of the work that you're doing every day. So to get started, um, this introduction to service. And I always think it's really helpful to explain to people the difference between interaction and service design, at least from my perspective. I think that interaction is really about designing for great experiences uh, when you're interacting with a product, an individual product. And I think the distinction between interaction design and service design is that in service design, what we're really looking at is um, designing for great experiences across a variety of touch points. So it's not just a single product. It's really thinking about that whole service system that has to be in place. So when we think about the whole host of touch points, what do we really mean? So imagine you're me, and you're sitting back, you're watching maybe uh, the last, because I just got back from Helsinki, so I missed the end of Breaking Bad. So I'm sitting there, I know, it was just, it was so traumatic. Um, <laughs> to watch it all by myself, you know, it was like, and I had to like make sure I didn't read things. Oh, it was horrible. Anyway, so imagine, uh, you know, I lost my dongle on the last trip. So I'm sitting there doing the, the sort of lean back experience, second screen, looking at the Apple site and going, yeah, I gotta get one. Um, and I get through, finish up. It's, uh, you know, a Saturday. And I know that the Apple store in the Stanford Mall in Palo Alto is just like a zoo. So I don't really want to interact with anyone, but I walk in, and what I'm able to do immediately is actually sort of go to the next touch point. I browse that wall full of all of the little items, right? I pick the item that I need, which is the dongle, and then I pull up the app on my phone, I select that item, and I walk out of the store. And because it's California, I don't even get a bag anymore. So I just walk, put it in my purse, and walk out. So think about that. Think about all of those different touch points that I interacted with. So it's me and my pad, you know, the car. The car could have had played a role. The store, you know, um, could have indicated to me as I walk in, but it was just good enough to be able to go because I know the scheme. I know the script for going to an Apple store. I'm really good at it. I've worked with Apple for a long time, and um, it's really easy for me to do this. Well, I have to admit, you know, this is, I'm kind of geeky, and so I pushed Apple before. I tried to buy one of the, uh, the new routers, the tower. Well, you actually can't do it. You can't walk out. It's a, they have a price point limit to what things you can actually check out yourself. But think about this. So if, you, if I went into the store, and when I went to buy actually the router, I did that. I interacted with the person. So it was a person-to-person -person interaction. Um, what really happened in the real experience with thinking about the dongle was a person-to-machine interaction. All of this was really person-to-machine, but I also interacted with the space, right? So there was something going on with that touch point. And then um, if you think about my interaction with 
the, uh, my Apple ID and the Apple Store and the application that I used while I was in the store, so it knew I was there, knew I was able to check out. That was all machine-to-machine -machine stuff that was happening in the background, right? So all of those things were going on. So if you think about this, what it really is, is that we have um, this person-to-person, person-to-machine, machine-to-machine interactions. All of those things really come to life through people. It came to life through me, how I read those resources. You know, somebody else may have had a totally different experience, right? If they don't, haven't worked with Apple before, if they you know, were Microsoft people, for example, and it's their first encounter. Um, how they read their resources, those resources that uh, Apple has provided for me, my personal history, and the context, right? I was, you know, long trip, relaxing, getting back into the world, in my community, and then knowing that I needed this thing. Um, the experiences are really multifaceted, co-produced, and shared. What I love about this illustration from Christopher Alexander, and I've used this for years, um, it's a photograph that he took in Chinatown in San Francisco. Um, and it really illustrates all of the five P's that are really involved in service design. It's the people, it's the product, it's the place, it's the process and performance. So if you think about this, you know, this meal, the people, all of those people, people who are sitting next to you, the people who are sitting next to you here today, they influence the way that you interpret this experience. So if you think back to the first night when we were here, and some of those young people were eliminated from, from the competition. Um, there was a guy in our row who just like screamed when one of the guys was eliminated. So that, was, that had an impact on my impression, one, of the guy who was screaming, and then two, made me think, well, you know, should I have reconsidered that person? I agreed with eliminating him, but should I have reconsidered? So that we were sort of co-producing that experience together, right? So that was the person-to-person -person thing. The, the product in this case is actually lunch, right? So there's a meal that's gonna come out of this. That's the product. The, um, the process, the chef here actually has to put things together, right? They have to think about what those ingredients are and how all those things come together in a sequence. Um, that's the process. The place, the setting, you can imagine what that smells like. How different is that from the Apple Store, right? Totally, totally different settings. And then the performance. So in this case, and what I like to think about in terms of performance with service is really both the performance, in this case, of the, the, the person who's creating this, and I'm sure he's moving around and adding things and doing all of this, so it's actually his physical performance, and, and again, things sort of Benny Hanna kind of restaurants or any of those where they're, the cooking is sort of um, out front stage. Um, but also, performance and, and service is also related to the value, right? So the, the sort of cost-value relationship here. Uh, if this was a really expensive meal, I would have totally different expectations. So all of those things have to be in line for this to work, right? So what's really going on here is we have people, as I said, they interact via touch points like I did with the Apple Store. Um, the service provider, they have to decide what to provide. So in the, in the case of the, you know, the kitchen in San Francisco, probably not a lot of conscious decisions there. It kind of probably grew organically. But in the Apple Store and the Apple service experience, we know how carefully curated and, and sort of crafted that is. Very different. And then the service medium. Those things that we have in the, in the store, those things that we have online in our different touch points, the pad versus the phone, all of that stuff, and the, and the way that those things work seamlessly together, that's the service medium. So what's really going on here, and this is actually after um, the service triangle from Gadry, but um, we call it a service as design triangle. And the reason is that I believe that when people are interacting with that service medium, they're designing. So it's kind of scary for us, right? But it's true. If we provide the resources, people have experiences. We can't control them. They're crafting their own experiences. And really, the sum of all of those experiences, that overall impression is the brand. That's what we think, right? Um, so it's the brand for both the providers, for both Apple and for, um, uh, for me as the, as the customer. Um, so services uh, address the functionality and the form of the service medium. 
Uh, again, in interaction design, we used to go back to Vitruvius and think about useful, usable, and desirable, you know, or the, I, I don't speak Latin, I wish I did, but the, the commodity and, and delight and whatever the third one is. Um, but in service, we actually have a different kind of formula. We've added a few to this. So it's useful and usable, that's the U2. It is also efficient and effective, and that's getting to that performance and value relationship, efficient and effective. It's desirable and differentiated, and again, I think for designers, this is a really important piece for us. It's not only desirable, but how is it differentiated? How is that environment for the restaurant very different from that environment for the Apple Store, right? And then it's both from, uh, it's the last piece, which is the P2, which is both from the provider and the person's point of view. And just to like hammer this home one more time, um, look at this image. It's, um, I found this online. It's a, it's a bank in Poland. It was an ING bank before it was re-transformed. But I think what's really interesting about this is that this is really a great example of the way that banking used to happen, right? We'd hardly think about this anymore. But it was like there were barriers between you and the service providers. You were always seeing backs. You know, there you see backs of other customers, but mostly you see a lot of backs of the service providers. There's other things in this space that are totally weird that are part of the service medium, like this some sort of weird kiosk thing that's at the entrance, you know, this barrier, as I said, the chairs, little brochures, this kind of funky poster on the wall. You know, all of these things are contributing to the service design here, consciously or unconsciously. But think about the way that banking has changed today. When we think about, you know, that we used to bank in one setting in that kind of physical environment, now we bank everywhere, right? It's one setting to any setting. It's known languages for banking. You know, my parents knew how to go into a bank and interact with a banker and a teller, and it was part of a different kind of relationship. If they had to interact with a bank the way that we interact today, I, I think it would just have driven them crazy. You know, it's like having to learn a whole new language for managing your finances. And I think the thing that's really interesting is even in the last, you know, two years, one of the transformations that happened is that banks took something that used to be backstage, where they machine read all of your checks, your deposits, right? But they took that backstage, backstage process that they had and they brought it front stage and gave it to us. So now, you know, we can deposit checks right from our smartphone, right? You just take a photograph, front, back, it's all set, you're done. You know, it's pretty remarkable. And I think banks would think it's really remarkable. When I talk about this in Europe, they go, like, what are checks? They haven't used checks in years. So it's kind of funny, you know? We used to, when uh, years back when we worked with NCR, and uh, the ATM machines, we'd say, the only thing you, you know, you're not going to be able to do is print money going forward. Well, I think we're getting to that point where we're going to be able to start you know, printing things in, in conceptually anyway, the difference in money. So I think we've seen this incredible transformation of some of everyday services. Um, so to sort of reflect back again, Service designers, we're really meta designers. We produce the resources for other people to have experiences for themselves. So we're designing for experience, we're not designing the experience. And I think, you know, what I heard Bruce Nussbaum say yesterday, it was really, really nice. It was like, you know, we're not designing experiences. That is not what we do. We just, we craft. I mean, and that's what's so amazing about being a designer, right? We craft these amazing things that give people information. We give them the information to know what to do, where to do it, when to do it. If we've orchestrated, if we prov provided the right resources and thought about that orchestration. So it's both physical and digital, these affordances that we, we work with. So this is, honestly, it's a really big challenge. Thinking about the right resources at the right place for anyone, anytime, no matter what their context and personal history. Uh, when I was um, telling this story in, in the London office, you know, they said, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah. And, and I said, so they had ordered in pizza. And they had a Domino's pizza in London. I'm like, really? Domino's pizza in London? And I said, so my perception of Domino's is totally different. My history with Domino's is totally different. When I was in college at Ohio State, 
my one of my professors, actually, yeah, one of my professors, worked on the Domino's identity. I would go to Michigan all the time, and they worked on it. So I had all of this back information about the guy at Domino's, all the hassle they went through in developing that identity. And the amazing thing is how much has kind of stood up pretty much intact through the test of time. But my perception of Domino's is so different than any one of those people who sat in that room that day. So how do we craft resources that are going to be timeless for everyone? So that's where the yikes comes in. And then if we think about that's really hard enough, but the conditions in which we're doing this are really changing right now. And that's what Thomas is going to talk to you about, two market trends we think are really going to have an impact going forward. Yeah. And we call those two trends Oh, we summarize them under living, uh, the first one, and mediary, the second one. Um, when we talk about living, it's really, there is the, and again, it, this, is not a to it, this certainly doesn't come as a surprise, um, the amazing adoption rate, the phenomenal adoption rate of, of smart, of, mobiles, uh, of mobile devices. Just some, some data here. 60% of the adults uh, in the US own a smartphone. Actually, just curious, does anyone here not have a smartphone? All right, two, wow. cool. <laughs> um, one, one, almost one and a half billions of smartphones will be sold in 2013. I mean, and it's amazing to also remember, um, if, you, if you go one larger, not just smartphones, but mobile phones in general, more people in the world right now have access to mobile phones than have access to running, wa uh, to, to running water. More, pe uh, more people have access to mobile phones than have access to electricity. Um, so the numbers are in the high 90, or in the, in the 90 percentile. The other thing, which I always, or not always, but sometimes have to remind myself of, it's fantastic. These things that we walk around with in our pockets have more computing power than we use to send a man to the moon, right? I mean, that's just incredible. Uh, not only are there, is the number of them growing, but also the capabilities are growing uh, tremendously, right? Um, so there's just a sample listing here of that ever-growing list of capabilities. So, you know, by now I can. Uh, location, of course, there is, I've just recently learned, there is more than one location, um, one satellite service to allow uh, location termination. There's GPS and then there's GLONASS, too. Um, the whole identity story, uh, the iPhone 5S with, a f with using the fingerprint as, a, as an unlock mechanism, or as uh, an unlock mechanism. Uh, three axis gyroscopes, I don't know, I'm sure <laughs> you've all played the thing <laughs> with the crumb balls or, or variations thereof. Um, I mean, I can go on and on. One of the, just to keep this, to cut this short, <coughs> one of the, um, I think Galaxy, the Galaxy 4S, actually has barometers, hygrometers, and ambient thermometers built in to, uh, into the phone or into the mobile device. So you have your own local, you have your own weather station. And not only that, now imagine there's a million, or whatever the number is, of for S, uh, Galaxy 4S users. What can that do in terms of weather prediction on a national, global scale even, right? It's, so the number grows tremendously. The capabilities are growing tremendously. The use of uh, different media is, is also, through those mobile devices, uh, is growing tremendously. So the experiences, the, the service experiences are being shared. Um, again, photos is sort of, photos is what put Facebook on the map. I mean, if you, if you look again back at some numbers, there's 500 million uh, images that were uploaded 2012. Prediction is it's going to be twice as many, a billion images in um, this year. Video, same thing. Just some examples. Um, it still boggles my mind. A hundred hours of video uploaded every minute on YouTube. A hundred hours. I mean, just right. No, what are people doing? <laughs> no, <it's> like <laughs> oh, that's another. Good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then there's Dropcam, which uploads more videos on YouTube, right? I mean, just incredible. Um, sound uh, is, according to Kleiner Perkins, um, who gave us this, uh, who this prediction comes from, uh, sound is in the in the more nascent earlier stages. But even even so, SoundCloud alone, 11 hours of sound uploaded every minute. Okay. 
the, the numbers are staggering, I think, the numbers of data. Uh, and data, same thing. I mean, just some examples. There's Waze, there's Jawbone, there's Yelp that we're all, I would think, uh, that we all are, I would think, familiar with. Sorry, just one second. So, and it goes beyond those, um, those, um, those service experiences. I mean, there is this, we're starting to look at this additional layer of information that gets over reality, right? If you think about the walking around information overlays, here's three examples, Yelp, Nokia, and, and Google. It's like, how do you, as a service and or a service provider, how do you differentiate yourself within that context? There's almost two layers to that. I mean, as one of those dots, versus, uh, as, as one of those items versus the other, on the one hand, but then even on the bigger, on the bigger scale, as Yelp versus Nokia, as um, on which of those information overlay layers is, is the right one, the better one? Is that an opportunity to differentiate as well? Yeah, last, when I was on my way to Europe last time, um, what was really interesting is I sat next to this guy who does um, uh, this kind of augmented reality for um, uh, big motion picture productions. And he was in the process of like thinking about how he could turn that into uh, everyday experiences for everyone. So think about, you know, what's our world going to be like when we're walking around with all of these, you know, sort of things? What's going to stand out? So 13 years ago, no, 11 years ago, we had sort of this prediction of a science, science fiction-y, futuristic world in, in Minority Report, right, where ubiquitous sensors are embedded in nearly everything. And um, while it may not be exactly a minority report today, but I think there's a lot of those things um, that, are, that we see happening in one place or another, in one way or another. So just some examples. On the, on the home side, smoke. Um, on the home side, Nest um, thermostats, we probably all heard of it. They just recently announced um, the addition of uh, a, smoke detect uh, a smoke detector to their product lineup. And again, smart, connected, um, sensors that are um, adding to the to the uh, data stream. The on the go side, just one example. Again, there's many others. Uh, Jawbone, um, fashion statements that help us live a healthier life, um, 24 hours a day, not just when we when we walk around and measure our um, our walking speed and, and and any other number of data, but also while we sleep. I mean, it's. Um, Almost everything has a sensor in it. Um, just some examples on the, on the play side too, uh, and that gets into that natural um, natural aspect of, of living, of that living uh, market trend as well. You know the the gestures that are being used by very early participants in the in the in the in the um, in the digital world. Um, there's a gadget here. I think it's not available in the U.S., but that fat boy. Um, bag allows you to charge your phone. You just put it on top of it. Uh, I think the, um, you can get it in, in many other parts of the world. The, the third sample that, that we show here is uh, Siftio. Just a, a pretty nifty play thing. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, um, it's regular cubes. They have sensors in them, so one cube knows where the other cubes are. And they're combined with little video screens in each of those cubes. Now you can imagine really cool games that are, that are going on I need to reload the batteries every week for my kids to keep on going there. Um, so sensors are starting to become everywhere and starting to, to impact things. And then, of course, um, a whole other and increasingly important um, aspect is the, is, the, is the voice component. Um, and this competition between Google Voice and Siri, I don't know where you stand. My personal experience is that I find Google Voice a little bit more useful um, than Siri at this point, but I think both of them are trying very hard to, um, to incorporate natural uh, interfaces and natural ways of, of interacting and or uh, engaging. So if you think about, so a lot of those things that 11 years ago were predicted in a science fiction, if you think about them though, um, think about for a moment just 
how we play how we play instruments or how we interact how how sophisticated and how nuanced we interact with instruments and then think about how relatively coarse and basic and at the very beginning i mean we can barely play play a couple of notes right if you so if you if you bear with that metaphor so um, all of those things are there they're starting to come but um, in a, at the same time i think we're at the very beginning of uh, of putting together all those those various touch points and ways to ways to interact and um, so and so you don't have to believe just me there is Mary Mika probably one of the best known um, predictors of things internet um, related in the beginning she got some things wrong I understand but that got better um, so she said in 2012 in her um, in her report about future trends of the internet that it's all about the reimagination re of everything, of nearly everything. It's powered by new devices, connectivity, UI, and beauty. Um, and the <laughs> almost even and sort of the confirming thing was a year later, this year in her in her latest um, uh, future trends uh, on around the internet uh, report, she speaks of yep exactly what I said last year, only better and faster, right? Only more so and faster. So the reimagination it's being reimagined and uploaded at an accelerating pace even. Um, in her report, she mentions, I'm saving you, 51 examples of reimagining big and small services and experiences. Here's just one example, um, you know, the transportation business that hailing a taxi, um, don't know how many of you are in area, live in areas where Uber is, is available. It's just, it, it really um, improved and changed that whole experience tremendously. Um, so she imagined uh, sh the, ma the areas that she mentioned were around transportation, entertainment, and personal service. Um, later in, that was 2012, later in 2012, Jim Sporer from IBM suggested additional areas of disruption edu in, around education, financial services, and healthcare, and I think we're starting to see uh, examples in all of those areas. Um, those first three, um, Mary Meeker incorporated in her 2013 report. The government one that uh, is probably one of the more challenging ones, but also, I mean, just looking at, I know I'm, I'm only a resident alien, but looking at <laughs> what's going on here, I think there is tremendous opportunity in the, in the, in the government area as well for, for disruption. So that's um, a quick overview of uh, the, the one trend that we call living. The second one um, <coughs> we call um, we, we name Mediary, and this is really around intention, data, and integration. What do I mean, intention? Um, Doug Sol wrote a book, but before I go there, let me, t let me take you to my breakfast, 8.30 this morning, and I was reminded by Shelley, oh, you didn't check in on your flight yet, did you? No, I didn't. So I'm pulling my mobile out, trying to check in, and don't know. What was it? Twenty-five minutes? Half an hour? I grew increasing. I grew increasingly frustrated. Had this thing. Had this phone with me, trying to check in, trying to get uh, reservation numbers, trying to get one entity, one service to recognize me, uh, trying to get the next service to recognize me, trying to get the third service to recognize me. In addition to the fact that I have to actually pay five dollars to even get a seat, um, just any seat. A middle seat is five dollars, but um, <laughs> the you know what brand that is. <laughs> <laughs> we so, won't mention. It. But but that's not that's not that's not the point here. The point is, I spent five or six. I spent five. I had five or six different interactions within that one. What I would like to think of as one service experience. I just want to reserve my my seat, right? And five times nobody recognized, I mean, the one thing didn't recognize me as the same person than the next one, then the next one, then the next one. So that's, um, so apologies for, for that frustrated and grumpy behavior this morning. But um, it's, what Doug Sell says in the attention economy is he's, al he's almost completely reframing this thing. He has, he uses this idea, uh, his vision of the future is that we will own our own profiles in our sensor databases rather than having to recreate them every time for a CRM system in, of one vendor and the next vendor and the next vendor. Um, 
he uses a scenario uh, in, in this book where in, in his book where he says, you know, you prepare for your guests um, at home, you discover your espresso machine isn't working for you and you need another one. So you pull your handheld device out from your pocket, uh, you scan the little square code on the back of the machine, you turn your hand you tell your handheld, maybe you just talk to it, right, that this one is broken and you need another one to rent or buy and you need it now. Um, now now the, now the difference starts instead of me having to enter it yet again. An intent cast goes out to the marketplace in his vision of the intention economy, revealing only what's required about me to attract offers that basically help me either replace or fix the espresso machine. A trusted service, and that's the mediary, puts it out into the marketplace and connects you with the best offer. And, well, you have a new espresso machine in time for your dinner party. So I said, it's a scenario. Um, but what he does is he really, <coughs> in a very interesting way, I think, reframes the, 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 the going paradigm, right? Uh, he describes the attention economy as something that grows around the buyers, not the sellers. So he says, it leverages the simple fact that buyers are the first source of money and that they come ready-made. You don't need advertising to make them. Which, I mean, it, it's pretty interesting. So it's also around the question of who's in control. It's CRM, customer relationship management, right? The big, the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, they all have their, right, and, and, and many, many more. Versus the, the term that he uses is VRM, vendor relationship management. So I'm in control of my relationship with, um, with vendors. Um, for that to happen, uh, and, and as I said earlier, in this whole mediary idea, there is uh, data, there's an increasing amount of data generated by all those sensors and mobile and increasing uh, and, and amazingly growing numbers of mobile phones. Sandy Pentland, one of the biggest, one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world, according to Forbes, um, describes big data uh, as this thing that comes from little, uh, that comes from things like location data off your cell phone or from, a credit, from credit cards. These little data breadcrumbs that leave you, that you leave behind as you move around in the world. So it's really about um, that we're starting to get to the point where those breadcrumbs uh, tell the story of your life. They tell what you've chosen to do. And that's quite different from those edited, curated, if you so will, version, at least um, you think that you edit and curated it, um, of yourself that you put up on Facebook. So it's implicit tracking versus explicit tracking where you, where you have an amount of, um, where you're sort of the editor of you, uh, of how you want your virtual self to be perceived. Um, there is, Again, aggregate versus individual data, it's in a way, super simply said, it's aggregate data, that's what allows Google to predict where the next flu outbreak happens before, you know, before the CDC knows it, um, uh, or before it actually happens. Um, in other words, taking data about lots of people and uh, removing the identifying uh, individual uh, elements, stripping them out and making uh, predictions of broader trends. The, the individual data, that's really that lets you that lets us predict things about uh, that lets you predict things about you. It's like this is how this is when do you go to Whole Foods next? Whole Foods next, or this is you know Target. I think they're um, the, the the local uh, they're born here, but um, wasn't there this amazing story about Target knowing that you're pregnant before you are? Um, it was about a, was it almost a year ago? The New York Times Magazine did a great story about it. And I think uh, the target person who was initially speaking with the New York Times reporter is no longer doing that. So, um, the I'm this increasing amount of sensors create an increasing amount of data. Um, to me, it's just mind blowing again to think of think of some of the numbers and try to to put them in relationship. That white circle is the number of people on Earth, <laughs> so it stays relatively consistent from. 2003 and 20. I know, we're growing a little. But if you look at the things connected to the internet, all the mobile devices, all the sensors, all the, um, they are, look at how that develops. So around 2010, somewhere in, 2000, uh, in 2010, 
the number of things connected to the internet was about equal to the number of people living on a planet. The prediction, depending on who you believe, Cisco says it's around 60 billion uh, things that will be connected to the internet in 2020. Just 60 billion around, yeah? Uh, JP Morgan says it's around 75, but you know, 15 billion here or there, give or take. The, the, it's roughly 10 things per person on the planet connected to the internet. Um, I, I, just a total side detail, I found it really fascinating. The, so the, the IPv6, the new, the new internet naming uh, uh, protocol, um, has been created so it provides 100 possible internet addresses for every, and it's, I'm not kidding, for every atom on the face of the Earth. <laughs> That's around two, 340, 340 duodecillions. I looked that up. It's <laughs> those nomenclature wasn't familiar to me. Um, so with that increasing amount of devices connected to the interwebs, with the increasing amount of data produced and or generated by <coughs> these devices, um, we think that pretty much changes everything. Um, and it changes things from an explicit curated version of yourself to an actual real representation of yourself in the digital world. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> we planned that. They liked it. So um, that's uh, a brief stab at two market trends that we think are important to consider as we think about service design in the future. And that raises questions that Kelly talks about. Yeah. So, you know, this is kind of weird, right? Um, I think we used to talk about these different eras all the time. Um, but I think this, you know, if you believe Mary Meeker and what she's predicting, you know, with her revised uh, uh, material for this year in 2013 about this notion of sharing, I really think that, you know, it's really, we're moving beyond that. And the fact that there's so much information about us everywhere and everything that we're doing, whether we're walking, we're sleeping, we're buying, we're searching, Everything we search for, think of, you know, just think about how much Google knows about us. It's phenomenal. So it's really this kind of digital representation of being that we don't have the appropriate kind of tools as people uh, to actually manage. So I think what, again, what's really interesting for us as designers are these kind of three questions. Um, uh, the first question, I think, you know, what Thomas was talking about is in, in the second sort of market trend is who's going to be the mediator? Who are we going to be trusting? Because we, will we be able to manage it ourselves? I don't think so. You know, um, gosh, years ago, I went to a talk um, when I was still living back relatively east. I think it was in, I was living in Pittsburgh at the time, and I went to a talk with a friend and, and collaborator, Hugh Deberly, and we heard this conversation uh, about smart dust. And it was really this notion that, you know, essentially they're the micro sensors and, and these micro machines, and you'd go to the, the, the story that that person told was you'd go to the hardware store and you'd just buy a bag full of smart dust, and then you'd take it home and figure out what you wanted it to do, and you'd sprinkle it around like fairy dust, right? And it would do these things, but we're really getting to that place where there is this potential for all of the stuff that we need to understand and manage. So who's going to be our mediator for doing that? Because I don't think, you know, we're all going to be like up to speed on how we manage and program that. Um, then I think, you know, the the other part of what what um, Thomas was talking about with this with this intention and thinking about this personal profiles and, and our sort of representation of self and, and identity. If you think about um, all I want to do is have a positive travel experience. All I want to do is think about I need a dongle. I don't want to think about that I have to look in the iPad and, you know, and all of those things that I went through. I don't think about that. I just kind of go through it transparently. So who has to cooperate? 
we know Apple does a really great job of master control of all those resources, but there are other kinds of experiences, and travel is a great one, healthcare is another one, where there's lots of different entities that have to interact and cooperate with each other. So who needs to cooperate? And then the third question is, what does that service design language look like? If we do believe that people are the designers and we're the meta designers, what kind of service interfaces are we going to produce to help people do these and manage for themselves? So let's go to that first question. Who's going to be the broker or the mediator, and what do they have to do? If we believe that in this broker notion, and I actually think that Searle has, um, that there's a lot behind that, and I think that if you talk to anybody in any ad agency today, they will tell you that the model is changing and they're not quite sure how to cope. But if we think about sort of what are the precursor services um, that illustrate this notion of intention and sort of intent casting, um, I, um, I think one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> We've had interactions with flies in Minnesota in the last three days. And it's just like, he showed up on the screen the other and a minute ago, and now he's here. Um, uh, but if you, I think Amazon subscribe and save is a really good example of one of these kind of intent casts, right? Do any of you use Amazon subscribe and save? Yeah. And it's great because you don't have to think about it, right? Every once in a while you get an email and say, eh, it's time again, but you don't really have to think about it. There are obscure things like I make my own yogurt and there's a particular yogurt starter that I like and I don't like to have to search for it because it's got the, you know, the right stuff in it. And, I've like found this thing, and all I have to do is subscribe to it from Amazon, and it comes. And so I don't ever have to go and search it out anymore. Lots of other little things, but I think that they're a really good example of that. I think TaskRabbit is another great example of that. Any of you use TaskRabbit? Do you know what TaskRabbit is? So TaskRabbit is where you can put out a task, and then you get a, a rabbit. Some people offer to do the service for you at, at varying prices, or you say well, how much you want to pay, or they tell you how much it's going to cost. Well, I, I love this story I heard on NPR about this couple, again, where else but Silicon Valley. There's a couple who's moving house in Palo Alto, and they have like two kids, and they need to do some renovation, and they need the move managed, right? They need the whole thing managed. They need the renovation, everything. So they hired essentially a rabbit to do this for them. But that rabbit wasn't in San Francisco. They weren't in Palo Alto. They were like in Omaha or something, you know, in the middle of the country. And they managed this entire process for them remotely because they could do it. There's no reason not to be able to do it. You know, when I bought my house in Menlo Park, I did the walkthrough via, you know, video cam via the iPad to, because I couldn't be there when I had to do the walkthrough on the house. So. I think it's, it's fascinating to think about this. That couple said that this woman saved their marriage. If she hadn't managed it for them, they would have killed each other. She was just, she was just there. She did it. So I think there's the contenders for being this mediary are everyone from, you know, banks, because we used to trust them, right, before they did all that really bad stuff. Um, the credit card folks. You know, I think there's new contenders in the credit card area, folks like you know Mint, uh, Intuit, those kinds of guys. Amazon certainly is one of those, and I think you know clearly Facebook is another organization that would love to be that mediator for you. What do you you know Facebook Connect is perfect, right? You're one person, every place you go through Facebook Connect. That was it was. Mark was brilliant when he instituted Facebook Connect, in my view was really prescient to be able to think about how that would work. Okay, so the second piece, which service brands and models do you need to cooperate or integrate to provide uh, the right resources for comprehensive service experiences? So, you know, so we talked about the, the travel experience and just even trying to check in for Thomas this morning. Uh, Bob Glushko, who is a professor at Berkeley, um, has a trip planning service, and I'll sort of reflect on that a little bit later. But I think there are other sorts of um, interesting uh, service providers, uh, service cooperatives that um, are some contenders. Um, 
there used to be this, um, uh, I will talk about that next. Um, I think uh, the one that we've illustrated here is uh, something called Porch. And Porch is a service that's available in, um, again, in the Bay Area. And what you can do, so you see the map on the left-hand side? So those are all the renovations that are going on in this neighborhood. So it's crunched all the data from the, you know, the, the things that you have to submit to get your building permits. And it says who the providers are. They know how much it's going to cost. There's recommendations associated. So think about how useful this information is. One, you can find someone who looks like they've done some really nice work in your neighborhood, right? You can um, and, and decide to, whether you want to use them or not. And you get a sense of what it costs to do something you know, just from here. But also, you can get a sense of, is this a good neighborhood to buy in? Are peeping, people adding value to their homes in this area? So really interesting. Um, another service that I think is fascinating is called Balloon. And um, you know, there's been, as, as Thomas mentioned, you know, this really radical transformation of online learning in the last year, last year and a half. Just absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal amount of services and amount of capabilities to be able to track people to track students, to help them you know, have the right information at the right time to, to, to learn. Um, what Balloon does as a service is it doesn't just go with one service and say, you know, these are all the Khan Academy things that you should be looking at, but it goes across the entire web, looks at all of the learning resources, helps you put together the right sort of learning resources for you personally based on what you need. Really, really interesting if you think about that. Again, it's kind of this mediary notion. OK, so the last one, <clears throat> I think, is um, this notion of what's the appropriate human-centered service design language to make it all transparent. So um, I'm sure many of you remember, and again, this is something that my friend and colleague Hugh worked on, Hugh Deberly, uh, the Knowledge Navigator way back when Apple had this concierge that did everything for you and you just talked to it, this funny little guy with a bow tie, right? Um, another service that was around in 2009 and actually was bought up, um, bought out, I think, by Palantir, which is a big kind of data cruncher in, in Palo Alto, but sort of was a service that, um, so I lived at the time in, in Pittsburgh and I was moving to Boston. And I wanted to find a restaurant that was sort of like, you know, the, the place that we used to go to, the kind of pub with um, many microbrews. And I wanted to find a place that was sort of like that in Boston. So all I had to do was put in, um, this is the place in Pittsburgh, and it could recommend to me what are the places in Boston, in my neighborhood, within walking distance, with appropriate reviews, that was sort of like that. So think about that. That was just a pub, right? But think of all of the sort ofs. I want something sort of like that. OK, here's all of the possibilities right near you. So it's a different way of thinking about what search is. So again, I think that's really fascinating. But I think that those are the sort of pre precursor service experiences. But I think the contenders today obviously are like Surrey and Google Voice. Um, my son was telling me that you know, he was in a meeting. He's also a, a designer. But he was in a meeting um, with his colleague and suddenly, the, um, it's an Android running uh, Google Voice. And suddenly, the, the phone said, oh, you need this? And it was like, what? So it was listening to the conversation and paying attention to the words and offering up what they might need at that moment. You know, we used to talk about this. I feel like I'm so old. But we used to talk about, wow, the days when you're going to be able to reach out and search for things and touch them. Well, you don't have to search anymore. It's all coming to you. It's all coming to you. Fascinating. Um, in Windows 8, I remember <laughs> I was sitting in a, um, a, a car uh, when I was working for Microsoft. And um, on my transition to, to the West Coast and working for Facebook. but. Um, I was with a, a colleague from Microsoft, and a text came in from my friend. And you know, it was just my phone was in the car, and it said, do you want me to read the text? And my friend hadn't heard the Windows 8 phone do that yet. And he was like, oh, yeah, read it. And I'm like, wait, I don't know what my friend is going to say. <laughs> you know, could be embarrassing. 
Um, so these kinds of things where there's listening and reporting and all of this stuff in the background, pretty, pretty interesting. So these guys, you know, and I, I have to admit, I like a lot of people from, from MIT, even though I'm out in the land of Stanford and those guys. Um, this is, is called FUNIF. And what FUNIF, does anybody here know FUNIF? So um, the last time I talked about this, it was like, yeah, uh, we worked on that, that, that's ours. I was like, oh boy, can you explain? <laughs> but um, these guys um, have essentially developed a way of you know, working with an Android system and being able to figure out what are the data streams? So what are those slices of data that I want to be able to track and learn from myself? And then how, what are the rules for that? You know, so think about if anybody uses the outlook and the rules and you know, it's like, or if this, then that, putting those rules together and reporting that data to you. So you have it, you can see it, you can, you know, like you're in control. Pretty remarkable, really pretty remarkable. And I think if this, then that is, again, one of those amazing things where you can put together these rules, um, it really starts to break down those barriers that the, the operating systems have put in place, right? Because we have all of these apps that know a little bit about us, right? But we don't have control over that. And what if this then that does is helps you get a little bit more control. It's not real control, but it's a little bit more. You're putting those rules in place. So, okay, so what does this really feel like? Um, like I said, uh, I travel a lot now in my new role at Fjord. And um, imagine I walk into my house in, in California and um, I just walk in and say, yeah, I'm off to London again. And so the house is listening, as, as it would, and says, okay, got it, Shelly. Yep, yeah, you're off to London again. Um, what happens next is based on my past trips, all of the information it has about me, my trusted service mediary, because I have a trusted one, right, um, requests access to a variety of those data slices. So essentially think about that Android thing that I just illustrated or talked to you about. So it's giving, it's got all of these data slices, things like, you know, my Foursquare check-ins, my airline preferences, the restaurants that I go to, the hotels I stay in. Think about what a travel experience really is. All of those things that have to come together, right? Um, so I select which sets I want to give it access to. You know, so it's one, two, three, really quick. I could just say, great, go for it, right? Then um, it notifies me that the trip is done. And of course, there's many magical algorithms in the background that have happened to make this happen, right? Um, and uh, what it presents to me, and again, this is a really crude little sketch, but um, it's tiles representing that trip that I could move around, directly interact with, and people who, uh, because it knows my network, who might be there at the same time, the people who I need to connect with in London, where I'm going to connect with them, how I'm going to connect with them. And in addition to that, all of my, um, the trusted media gives the service providers an awareness that I'm coming, right? So just like what the, the Starwood people do, they know when you walk in the door that it's you. Think of all of those service providers knowing it's you. I could tell you it would have made a huge difference on my last trip in Europe. So what's really going on here? The first one, we have the intent cast, this kind of magical wish going out. The second one, there's inferencing going on in the background. It's gathering the data in the third one. There's a negotiation between me and the service going on in the, in the fourth one. The delivery comes back to me, right? And in the last one, the recipe is vi visualized. So this is really the living, intentional, and reimagined service experience, right? The second piece, is this intention, I think, is really important. I've casted this wish out to a trusted service mediary. Who's that going to be? And then the third piece is really that this is reimagined, that I select which slice of my personal data I have the control. We don't have this today. We don't have that kind of control, and I think it's really critical for us to be thinking about this. So um, yeah, real-time control. 
So sort of in closing, I think what we're, what we're really getting at is um, what's it going to take for successful um, uh, mediaries? We think that there's really three expectations that they have to meet. The first one is really about trust, right? We routinely place our trust in Amazon. I do it every, you know, I do it every day, all the time. I do it with Google, I do it with Apple, I do it with a host of other big guys, right? They offer me a lot in return. So if we go back to the very beginning when I was talking about the value and the performance, that cost value relationship, I feel like they give me a lot in return. If we think about, you know, sort of what, we think about Facebook and the kind of cost value there. We don't pay anything for that service. Um, is that value there, right? So I think, you know, this is one of the most trusted brands in the United States. Is it going to be American Express? Is that going to be their next thing, right? To be that mediary for me, right? They're, they're a mediary for me in a lot of ways already. How hard is it for them to think about this? You know, I think the future of money is really going to change, as I was alluding to earlier. And so I think, you know, maybe, maybe this is a different kind of area. All right. Then the second piece that I think successful mediaries are going to have to cope with is this notion of ownership, right? So, okay. My medical data, I'm willing, if I get a lot of value back for giving that up, personalized, I'm going to give it up. But it's, it's one of those things where I really want a lot of value. Because I know that the, the sort of aggregated data that Thomas was talking about earlier, that can provide a lot of information that's depersonalized. But I think that if I'm going to learn a lot about me, and it's really here a lot about learning and about what we can gain from all of these services that are out there and knowing all of this about us. How can we learn about ourselves, right? So I'm willing to give, to do a trade for um, high utility. If it's really going to mean something about, I can change my life. I can change my behavior. I can get better. You know, as BJ Fogg talks about, I can get better at flossing. You know, he talks about flossing every day. I can get better at flossing. Um, versus something that's really low utility. Okay, so I have to admit, I use OpenTable a lot. If I think about it, OpenTable knows a lot about where I go and what I eat. You know, I'm not really comfortable with OpenTable. I don't know them as a brand that well. I've only known them virtually. You know, it's like, that's not very useful to me in terms of giving up my data to them. So maybe I want a mediary to disintermediate that data. So there's that. Um, we all know that how challenging it can be to even manage our, our privacy settings on something like Facebook. You know, when I, when I was at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg's sister, there was an incident where some data that she had shared had been reshared by someone else. And, and the things are so big and so complex now it's hard for us to even think that we've managed, right? So I think, you know, it's a really good example. Am I really sharing with just friends? If I share with that friend and they have a friend that's a different friend, and how does that really, how does that all work? How does that all work? You know, I was talking to someone yesterday about Dropbox, and it was like, so, yeah, so that model of how that, you know, it's like, so if I'm changing it and you're changing it the same, then yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm pretty good with tech. Um, and then the last one, I think this is really, um, uh, really important, this value. Again, going back to the beginning of our story. Um, just because I give up the data doesn't mean I want to give up everything. Um, we need to know, we want to know, what we can know or infer about ourselves and what we're giving away to, about our friends, about our family. And I think what's really um, uh, nice about this is to think about all of these different dimensions, and these come from, from Hugh, Hugh Deberly, 
Um, it's, the, uh, it's really the taxonomy of personal identity. These are the dimensions that we want to want to be thinking about managing and thinking about providing the right sort of resources and the design language for people to be able to design and manage for themselves. So we talked about finance early on, right? Our work life. One of the things that I think is really going to happen, you know, so I, I mentioned in the education realm where, you know, the, the systems are in place to really augment children's interaction with the knowledge systems so that they get the right things at the right time to help them advance and learn and grow, right? I think that's going to come to work. I think we're going to be in the situation where, oops, what happened? Battery. Battery? Yep. Coming. We're on reserve. Oh. Where is that trusted media? <laughs> So the, the, what I'm saying about this work, what I think is really interesting is that I think our work lives are going to become much more augmented. So all you have to do is look at what's happening on LinkedIn, right? How many people have, have validated you today? Right? What did they validate you for? Are those skills that you really have? What are they doing with that data, all those skills? What do they know about me? What do they know about you for validating you about that? Do they assume that you have that skill because you can evaluate? Do, you know, it's like, whoa. Think about what's going on with work. That's our work world. Um, I think, you know, that LinkedIn, that, and that was just brilliant. And think about what they're doing with the media and the, you know, the way that they're sending out, what they're learning about you by the things you choose to read now, too. So, interesting. Interesting. People talk about Facebook. I think LinkedIn's pretty interesting. But, I, but I've always been about work. Um, self. Think about you know those the things that I like to do the hobbies that I have how much I love to go to the farmers market on Saturday morning um, all of those kinds of things the well-being you know I I, would, I think I uh, back in 2009 I used to talk about the sensor that I carried around in my pocket um, uh, that was monitoring my activity it was not much more than a you know a glorified pedometer um, but uh, think about all of those things that it's if I had maintained with that how much I'd know you know I have a friend who has been a religious user of Foursquare for since Foursquare came out and he feels like he knows so much about himself by being able to reflect on the, the activities that he's had so again think about these things integrated um, the, the social what does it know about me and my friends um, and then the last one, the civic one. I think this is the one, as, as Thomas alluded to, and, and I think, you know, Jim Sporer talked about that we're really going to start to see service uh, innovation in government systems. And boy, not a moment too soon. I think we need this. We want this. There's so much opportunity for us to think about how things could change. So, so it comes down to when we're thinking about living service worlds. I think when we come back to it, and you reflect all the way back to the beginning of the talk when I said that service design is really meta design, and we design the resources for other people to have experiences, um, the services are going to know our intentions because we will have designed them. If we do the right things as designers, if we you know, sort of stand up and say, we're going to get in place to help people learn how to be literate with their data, you know, we, we do a great job at helping people learn how to read. We do less well at helping them learn how to be visual. Uh, we all know that as designers and going through school that that was a different kind of um, literacy. But think about, you know, managing how we interact with data and how important it is that we help our kids learn about data literacy. Um, but the services will be us. And, and I think that that's the, the sort of the big shift here, that providers, those people, if they can really address those three dimensions about trust and about um, uh, identity and um, all of those things, then what they're going to do is they're going to be able to help us shape exceptional relationships. And I think that that's what it's really all about. It comes back to the relationships putting the things in place so we can get back to the things that are really important. 
the person-to-person interactions, the things that make our lives better, the things that you know sort of fulfill us on a day-to-day basis. So anyway, with that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.